One of the things that I've been kind of learning in the last two years or so is the importance of church history. So for me, it was really cool when upon arriving here, the adult, I found the adult Sunday school class literally doing class on church history. Um, now, I'm a bit of a history buff in general, but then combining, combining love for God with history, it, it just makes for a beautiful combination. So with that said, you'll find that based off of this passage and based off of, of what I'm going to preach about today, there's a lot of similarities between other sermons that I've preached in the past. In fact, I preached out of uh, 1 Timothy back in April, I believe it was, um, and touched on actually the section that was preceding this section as well as the end. Um, and so just as kind of a back, or backdrop for you guys to know, um, I'm just going to kind of continue along and for the next few times that I preach working through Timothy just because I feel like it's good to build off of something. and It's a lot easier from a preaching standpoint to always kind of plop in out of somewhere randomly. Um, so that's just kind of the, what's going on here. Now, touching back on the church history, Timothy is ripe with church history. Because uh, when you look at the book of Acts, you see some of the things that uh, you see Timothy and Paul... Uh, you find out where they were going on their missionary journeys. In this case, uh, Timothy is in Ephesus, and we'll touch on this a little bit later, but there's, that's information that's key for us to know. It helps us also to understand the whys of what Paul is talking about, the whys of why he's saying things. Because sometimes we read these letters that Paul writes or, or other scriptural epistles, and we're kind of, we kind of read it along, but we take it out of context. We don't we don't fully get the depth of what he's saying. And so that's very important as well. Now, as you all know, uh, Monica and I traveled back home earlier this week uh, for her grandmother's funeral. And I know I was going to preach uh, out of this passage. Uh, and so that was on the forefront of my mind. And when we went home uh, to Scranton, PA, uh, her grandmother was a devout uh, Catholic woman. And so we had, uh, the services were all mass. Now, as I was taking in the mass, one of the things that, that I, I was just observing was how when the truth of the gospel kind of veers off, things get just weird and distorted. And the point of this morning is not at all to be a focus on why the Protestant Reformation was better I'm not going that direction, but I, I want this to be an example, is when the gospel shifts from being focused on what Jesus did on the cross and the work of salvation to elements, things that are not, where the faith is put not on Christ, a lot of issues start to happen. The church begins to weaken. And as we go through this morning, we will see this. The purity of the gospel, though, will always be an issue that the church is always going to have to fight. And from the outset, I know usually you want to give kind of an application or a charge at the end. But from the outset, that's what I want to be taken away from this morning. Is that we need to preserve the gospel for what it is. Um, touching back with the Catholic Church... There's a reason why the reformers fought the way they did. And I'm not talking about warring. I'm talking, though, about going into debates. Anyone who has um, been through the church history class or anyone who's ever studied church history, you see just how important this was. It wasn't just a matter of, of guys who were super religious debating things. The reformers understood that this is, this is important. This is our salvation. This is God. And so in our passage today, we see already Paul back in the first century working through much of the same things. Now in our passage, Paul's dealing with initially um, 
he, he addresses that there's false teachers. In fact, some of your Bibles might even list the section before this as being titled Warning Against False Teachers. Paul's writing to Timothy in Ephesus about this. Now, Paul then shifts to this section, which becomes more or less a test, personal testimony of his own. Now, there is reason to believe, as a background here, that, and we, we've seen it in other epistles, namely Corinthians, where he was challenged, his authority. Was his teaching the right teaching? And this wasn't just coming from one side, this was coming from two sides. You had the liberal side, the conservative side, all coming at him. But this letter is written to Timothy, and it was to reinforce him and to, to give him a charge to stay firm in the truth of the gospel. So this morning we're going to look specifically, though, at how Paul defended his testimony, but at the same time, he simultaneously will show us a picture of salvation. And then further, he will also show the importance of maintaining the purity of the gospel. So, as we dive in, these verses, these are things to keep in mind in these verses. Now, just a little bit more of the context, and, and this, before I go on, this is important. Anytime you study scripture, it is always huge to know the context of what you're reading, because it helps give you more of a full, robust meaning for what you're seeing. So, let's consider briefly verses 8 through 11. Um, I mean, 3 through 11, as I referenced earlier, Paul's talking about false teachers. But in verses 8 through 11, and spe specifically, Paul is addressing an issue that uh, more or less points to legalism that was going on. And the legalism, we, we're not given much more information. Um, the various commentaries, some spoke to Judaism, some spoke to uh, Gnostic type of things, which is just a, a, a higher life kind of mentality. But at the end of the day, we know that it was a faith plus works kind of teaching that he was dealing with. Um, it's probably dealing with Judaism, or Judaizers, sorry, uh, because of his use of talking about the law and how it was good. Now, as I referenced earlier, if you go back into the book of Acts, when Paul leaves Ephesus, which is where Timothy is right now, he predicts that people are going to come in and distort the truth and teach false things. And the thing is, he was right. This is what's going on. Timothy, he, he left there because he needed someone close in his, in his circle to defend the truth. So, verses 12 through 14, Paul shifts into talking about his own personal life after an opening of this warning about false teachers. He gives a testimony of his life before the road to Damascus. That is when he was converted uh, in a very powerful instance that happens in the book of Acts as well. But the thing about this is Paul's doing something else. He's also showing how powerful the gospel is for, for Timothy, for others that are going to read this letter. He's showing how powerful it is, how the transformation happens. First, he attributes his salvation directly to Jesus and Jesus alone. Look at verse 12. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, Commentaries that I read observe that in most of Paul's other letters, he just goes into, I thank God, when he kind of goes into his, intro, his uh, intro about him. But here he's specifically talking about Jesus. And as we go through this morning, we'll also see why he did that. But it's worth noting also, if you didn't pick up on it audibly or while you're reading that he mentions a combination of either Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus four times in the span of five verses in this section. And there's a reason for this. It's namely to com combat the teachings. As I said, it was likely he was dealing with Judaizers, people that were, were of the Jewish background, but had they were 
somewhat Christian, it, 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 was, it was hard. They were, they were trying to say, well, you're right about this Jesus thing, but you still need to do this. Paul's emphasis here is to combat that, or there were also teachings that the Judaizers were coming in and saying that Jesus, he was just a great teacher, but he was not the Messiah. Now, to understand this more fully, Christos, which is the Greek word that we get Christ from, that is the word for anointed. Or in other words, Messiah, because Messiah means anointed one. Paul is enforcing to his opponents while also reminding Timothy that Jesus is the Messiah. And further, he's emphasizing that not just as the Messiah, but salvation is through him alone. That's important to remember. Okay? The second point that Paul brings out in this section is he also shows that Jesus is directly involved in not just not just his salvation, but also his calling. This comes to light more when we consider the little participle phrase, or the phrase that, um, and I'm reading out of the ESV, um, where it says, "Who thank him who has given me strength. Um, the various translations give you something along the same lines. But this section is important to remember, because in the Greek, the there's, it's formed out of one verb in the Greek. And that Greek verb actually translates to simply mean empowered. So we read it and essentially, I thank him who has empowered me, Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, it goes further though, because the word empowered, he uses elsewhere to designate times where God divinely empowered uses this in other epistles. Understanding this, Paul is denoting that Christ legitimately has empowered him in his faith and in his service and in his salvation. He's showing that Jesus is the one who enabled him to come to faith. Enablement was another word that, that sometimes was translated from that Greek word. So Paul is not, again, just defending his ministry here, but he's, he's also talking to us about what salvation looks like, how salvation works. And it's enabling that Christ enables us through the Holy Spirit to come to faith. Third point, in this small section, Paul shows us that Jesus' involvement in his calling specifically to him, but, but also in salvation, is much more intimate than merely a basic belief in a man who died for our sins and rose again. When we slow down to think about it, we begin to see that Jesus is so close to us when we come to faith. It's not just that he's off in heaven and just, yeah, I want that person to, to be, be a Christian. Go ahead. No, he's close by. And that's powerful, because I think sometimes we, we do feel distant from Christ. We, we feel distant in terms of how our salvation worked out. But when we stop and slow down and see how Paul, through his own personal experience, explains how close Christ, and now Paul is different from us, that Christ did specifically talk to him. That is true. But, Overall, through other writings, and this is another important thing with Scripture, always taking it and not just reading it out of its own one little piece, but considering the scope of it, we see that this is a truth that comes out, that Christ is very close to us in our salvation. Going further, consider John fifteen sixteen, when Jesus says, to his disciples, and he was speaking overall about those that would come to faith. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And this, again, brings back the saving power of the gospel that is in Jesus alone. And we're not distant from him. So these three points that I consider, or that we consider even out of this section, 
it kind of makes me think of the movie Miracle. Okay. Yeah, I see Taylor smiling uh, because I know that's her favorite movie. But uh, as a hockey fan growing up, uh, as a kid, the story about the Miracle on Ice team from the 1980 uh, Olympics, uh, really cool, and then they made the movie about it. So in the movie, uh, and the movie's actually pretty close to real life uh, in terms of how everything came together. Uh, head coach Herb Brooks puts together a team, but he puts together this team that's not based on talent. He doesn't just pick the best of the best. He's got other advisors there that are at this, this tryout, and he writes down just 20 some odd names and says, this is my team. This ruffles some feathers because they're like, you don't even have the best guys there. To which he replies, I'm not looking for the best ones, I'm looking for the right ones, okay? Each person on that team had specific roles that he was looking for. They would function in a certain way. Now, obviously this is not a direct one-to-one -one correlation of what our relationship with Christ looks like, but there's a lot of similarity. For instance, the coach picked people that other coaches in that situation probably wouldn't have picked. Again, I'm looking for the right ones, not the best ones. Isn't that how God works? God chooses individuals for only reasons that he knows, including individuals that no one else would have picked if they were in his shoes. And for those reasons that we don't know, God's reasons ultimately have to do with his kingdom. Which is a whole other discussion for another time, but I think it is worth mentioning in this instance that salvation is not purely about us. Salvation is ultimately about the kingdom of God. And when we come to faith and we understand that we have a role within the kingdom of, of God. That just helps actually embolden us because it takes a lot of pressure off of us. We realize that, that okay, you know, I, I might not understand fully yet what God's purpose is here, but all right, I have a purpose. And that's important to remember. With the consideration of Paul's own testimony, all this helps flesh things out a little bit more, a little bit more and leads to kind of the, the apex or the, the crux of this passage, which is where the title of the sermon comes from, and it's in verses 15 and 16. So just to recap, Paul says, and I'm picking up in, in verse 13, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, Excuse me. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Jesus Christ. And then he goes into verse 15 and 16. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of whom I am the foremost. But I have received mercy for this reason that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Again, remember that point just before this. Our purpose within, as Christians within the kingdom of God is not, our salvation is not just about us. We have a purpose. In Paul's case, while yes, he had his ministry, God was also taking a man that no one would have ever expected to be transformed by God. In Christ, that is. And did a powerful work there. But that's kind of true of all of us as Christians, too. When one gets to know, if, if, we're, if one was to know all the depths, all the ins and the outs of our lives, they would see the transformation that's there. And that whether it's Christian to non-Christian, it becomes an evangelistic kind of 
thing. Or Christian to Christian, it becomes an encouragement kind of thing. God uses our salvation in that way. Now, recall earlier how I noted the presence of, of Christ Jesus. Um, and this serves also to combat, again, the Jewish opposition, as well as any legalistic teaching that was going on that was predicated on any works of any sorts or any rituals that were, going, that were associated with the faith. Paul stops all that when he says, Christ came to save sinners. This is what makes the gospel beautiful and freeing. It's unconditional, yet at the same time so intimate because the Savior chose to bring those to faith whom he has chosen. He takes it further again and he, to the point of, of whom I am the foremost. Now he has in mind what he just wrote about, but it's also important to slow down and think about this again. Because this can be impact and carries even more weight for us than we, we would see initially. Our initial reaction is, okay, Paul's saying, yeah, I lived a bad life and I'm the worst sinner. But let's consider Paul's life for a little bit. In verse 13, he recalls that he was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent. We see Paul had these sins in his life and his full-on hatred was evil. And yet God transformed his life. But let's go, let's look at it in another sense. That's looking at it from a Christian perspective. His sins of blaspheming, um, being violent, being a persecutor. That's from the Christian perspective. But from the Jewish perspective, which is really where his opponents are coming from, from the Jewish perspective, Paul was actually living a perfect life. Because he was following the law to a T, the Jewish law that is, to a T. In uh, Philippians 3, 4, and 5, Paul says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He would, if there was anyone that was doing it right, he was doing it right. And yet, he still needed Christ to save him because his performance wasn't good enough. Now, the other, to circle back to the, the point of verse 16, but I received mercy for this reason that I, that in me, that as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. He's, he's shown the power of the transformation of the gospel and when the Holy Spirit comes into the life of the believer. Now, if you're like me, you love movies or books where a character develops throughout the book or the movie and he transforms. So another favorite movie of mine, to kind of show an example here, is Toy Story. I will be a kid at heart forever, and Toy Story will always be my favorite Disney Pixar movie. Well, in that movie, I'm pretty sure everyone has seen it, recall Woody and Buzz are basically enemies, or they, they oppose each other for the first half of the movie. Uh, Woody's basically jealous of Buzz right here, because Buzz Lightyear's all like, you know, he's got those wings, and he does that, as Woody says at one point, he does that, that, that whoosh thing. Uh, but Buzz has all the cool things. Woody's just a poor old cowboy. So Woody's jealous of him. Woody feels like he's no longer important. However, when Woody goes to the point of trying to get rid of Buzz, everything in the movie falls apart. And eventually they have to have, they have, to have it out with each other. Um, and there's a change that begins to occur. And they end up having to band together to get back to their owner um, who had moved from the house and they were left behind at the neighbor's house. Uh, but they have to band together to get back. An event had to happen to transform those characters. Because from that point on in the movie and in the other Toy Story movies, those two were best friends. There was an event that had to happen. Okay? Similarly, this is again how the gospel works. It brings a transformation in a person's life. When one comes to faith, 
and the Holy Spirit comes into their lives, there is something that begins to go and transform them. Now, it's not always a night and day switch. That happens in some cases. But even in Paul's case, when you study the book of Acts and you study his other letters, you come to the conclusion that, or you come to realize that Paul did not just immediately jump right into the ministry. Paul even had to have about 14 years of study before he jumped into his ministry. And in his life, you can only assume that God had to start breaking certain things down in his life to show him the truth, teach him the truth of the gospel. Okay? And that's the same for us as Christians. So it's not always a night to day kind of thing. It's always a slow transition, more often than not. And often, that also just takes place throughout the rest of your life until uh, you come to glory. But how, is the power, how powerful is this gospel? Again, consider Paul. Hardness of heart is overcome. It is like, for anyone that's read uh, or is aware of um, people that oppose the church, a man named Richard Dawkins, who wrote a book called The God Delusion. This is literally like him coming to faith for the Christians to see this. When they hear that Paul is now a Christian. In fact, in the conversion story in Acts of Paul, the man that he has to go see is even apprehensive at first about it. He said, whoa, 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 God. I've heard about this guy. We know what he's up to. I don't... He basically... Like, I don't think... I think you've got your signals mixed. You must mean another Saul. And God's like, no, no, no. This is who I mean. And he will go on to serve me, but he will also understand how much it is going to cost him to serve me. But point of the matter, the fact of the matter here is that God takes the people we least expect and brings them to faith. Which brings another point to consider out of this passage, and it's actually not on my notes, it just kind of came to me as, as I'm talking here, is isn't that why it's so important to pray for those that we don't, or that don't know the Lord? If you're like me, honestly, there is a sense of doubt with people, because they're entrenched probably in the way they live. But I have to believe that what, even though it's not stated anywhere in Scripture specifically, that Paul was being prayed for. I have to believe that the way the church was at that time, they knew he was against them. God was being prayed to to intervene in that situation. I don't think they necessarily expected him to come to Christ, but he was being prayed for. And for us, that's important to remember. Especially in this day and age where there's a lot of hostility towards Christianity. And some of it is even within the church. And this is going to bring us to the next point. Um, recall that the Jewish law was really um, surrounded by perfectionism and moralism. That was a lot of what Paul was up against. But he was also against things on the liberal end. Uh, of the spectrum as well, where people were then trying to distort what he was saying and basically say, well, that means this Christ saved, Christ saved me, saved, you know, purified my sins, I can still do whatever I want. Those were charges that were also lobbed against Paul, so Paul had to defend those charges from both sides as well. And if you recall, in verses 9 and 10, uh, even though we didn't read them, Paul actually goes through and he lists very clear and evident sins that we're not to do. Paul was in no way throwing out obedience or holiness in the Christian life. He understood, though, that it was through Christ that that came about in a person's life. He understood that those were not the essence of the faith. The essence of the faith was Christ. The focus 
and object of our faith was Christ. Everything else follows underneath. And this is what also leads them to this idea of protecting the gospel, which he had set out in the beginning of the letter, and then he picks up, actually, in verse 18 through 20. He explicitly now charges Timothy with defending the faith. But I don't think our English translations do justice with what he's saying here. And I'm specifically looking at the term, um, in ESV it says, to wage the good warfare. Um, in other translations, it's to fight the good fight. The Greek term is translated literally to go into battle. That's how powerful of a, of a term that he uses. That's how important preserving the truth of the gospel was to Paul. He saw how these distortions were coming in and how, how it could wreak havoc. But he, the terminology he uses with these two men in uh, verse 20, Hymenaeus and Alexander, he speaks of how it's actually shipwrecking their own personal faiths by falling into these, these traps. So he's not just looking at it from the big picture of, of the church gets thrown off. He's looking at it and saying, their faith is being corrupted now. And in an odd way, you see that Paul's actually caring about them. See, this is not just about saying who is right and wrong. It's about the faith, but it's also caring about other people. It's not to say that my doctrine is right, yours doctrine is wrong. No, it's about salvation of man and about their walk with Christ. But how serious is Paul about this? Well, he's so serious that he basically enacted church discipline um, when he says, I've handed them over to Satan that they may not learn to blaspheme. Notice, though, he does not say they're going to hell or that they're gone forever. His point of church discipline was that they would learn while outside of the church just what they were missing in the church. They would come to see the truth that they missed. Again, caring about the faith of a person. It wasn't about Paul saying these guys are wrong. I'm going to show them. He was saying, no, like, this is a lot bigger than just being right and wrong. This is about the truth. He was willing to go to that point to bring in church discipline. Now, I think this sheds a little bit of light for us in our modern day, though. And it, it sheds a little bit of light about, and again, this is where the church history part of things comes into play. Um, about the way the church is currently in the U.S. And it's been, I mean, it, it goes on and out in church history forever. But I think there's a reason why things seem just so fuzzy overall in Christianity in the U.S. There's many men who are prominent in the church, and they seem to be more concerned about tolerance than they are about standing and fighting for the truth because they are scared of division. Touching back on, on this passage here, men crept in and were adding to the gospel and distorting the gospel in Ephesus. And this caused problems and hurt the faith of many, and it weakened the church. There's a reason why the church is a little weaker in the U.S. currently. And it's because of this same thing. See, Paul understood, and what we need to take from this, Paul understood that people would object to the gospel, the pure sound doctrine of it. And that it needed to be protected and needed to be done with a vigilance and a sharpness. And he understood that division would occur from it. But in our current day and age, we're, 
And this is not saying to go about around being ignorant, or I mean, sorry, arrogant, and prideful and hateful. That's not what he's saying at all. But when you stand for the truth, it's going to cause division. And Paul understood that. So for us today, if we let the gospel become something that it's not, it weakens us. This shows up in the way that truth is being turned into moralist on the legal, moralism on the legal end, on the legalist end. And then on the liberal end, we're getting self-help, positive thinking, or overly tolerant views that are coming in. And then the church becomes distracted because you have debates over this. When at the end of the day, what needs to be spoken about first and foremost by the church is Christ came into the world to save sinners. Of whom all of us are the worst. Because apart from Christ, all of us, we have the same destination. How can people know the truth and the power of the gospel when we make it into something that can be attained by ourselves through our own measures, our own acts, as you, if you will, our own works? Or how can people know the power of the gospel when it is there to serve us and us alone? That is, I only go to God because I need some sort of positive energy in my life. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Holiness is very much important. And yes, God loves us deeply. But those are the results of salvation. They're not the focus of salvation. See, the difference between Christianity and other religions is that the object of the faith is Jesus Christ. And it's Him alone that we are saved by His grace and that the process of becoming more and more holy is brought about in response to His grace with the presence of the Holy Spirit in us conforming us to be more and more like Him. And in all of this, that we serve Him. Other religions, it's pretty much about the man. And we're, we're losing some of that. Now just briefly, for the current landscape, for those that might not be aware, um, just because I keep tabs on this. The church is being weakened in certain areas regarding cultural pressures. A couple weeks ago, uh, for those that know of him, John MacArthur, who's probably one of the best Bible teachers in the country, he and some other men, um, who uh, a lot of them are involved with League of Air Ministries, which is R.C. Sproul's Ministries, they put out a statement of, of faith regarding social justice. Because what's going on is, within the church right now, there are people that are making social justice the focus of the faith. With all that's going on um, this, the past few years with you know, the various things with race relations, um, it, it's just distracting people. This is, in a sense, the moralism when you begin to focus on this. Yes, we are called to live justly. And the statement of faith, MacArthur and these other people, they got attacked because people were trying to say that they don't care about this stuff. When they very clearly said, no, we do care about it, but our focus primarily is on the gospel. That's where our statement should be. Um, just to add some weight to that, just to understand what who the types of people that were signing this, this document. Um, now, R.C. Sproul, who I know a lot of, a lot of people in here know, um, now he passed away earlier this year, or last year, sorry. His wife, though, signed this, which can tell us that R.C. would have himself signed it, okay? That's how important this is. But yet, let's look on the other side of the aisle. The other side of the aisle, and this is something that's been going on for a while, but we have churches that are now allowing homosexuality, that there's, there's tolerance to that. Now, it's a slow kind of thing because some churches, while they've gone outright to say, hey, we're allowing this, uh, we're even gonna have clergy who are this, uh, 
some are saying, well, they, they kind of are doing it just in a very subtle way where the, the, the signs are there that they're just going to keep bending and bending and bending until they get to that point that other churches have already gone, which is making it acceptable. This is what's called antinomianism, um, which anti um, against nomi, uh, nomian or nominal um, law, anti law. They don't care about the holiness side of it. So we see things that are going on in the church from one side and from the other side. And what's going on is people are, are scared to stand up against certain things because of fear of division and fear of being labeled a bigot or driving many not to stand firm on the gospel. But as Paul understood, there's much at stake when even the simple issue of the pure gospel, which Dr. MacArthur and other prominent men of the faith in the country have stood for, they're getting attacked for standing for the scripture. They understand how much is at stake when the gospel needs to be focused on. And when that should be what's superseded, or that it should not be superseded by other things. So in closing, why is all of this important to defend? The gospel is the truth, and it teaches us how man can be saved. But how do we know it works like this? How do we know that this is the truth? And I go back to verses 15 and 16. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. One note before I close with this is whenever Paul would say this saying is trustworthy, in a sense it was like a creed or a confession of faith that he was basically saying this is important. Whenever we see that, that should really zone us in to read what he's saying. But how do we know this is a trustworthy truth? It's because of the transformation that takes place in the lives of the believers. In this case, most notably, Paul, a man who lived a life that was squeaky clean by the standards of the moral and the Jewish law, but yet by the standards of Christianity was the brutal and barbaric. One way or another, he needed Christ. One way or another, we all need Christ. This is the power of the gospel. This is the importance of the gospel, and is why it is so important to protect and take care of. Paul understood that. That's why he charged Timothy with it. Now, may we be, as a church here, may we continue to do that. Because one of the things I love the most about this church is the attention to stand firm for the truth and to not waver. And as an outsider from Pennsylvania, knowing how the Northeast is, it speaks volumes of how this church stands firm to that truth as well. In the midst of the chaos that kind of goes on in the Northeast with liberal um, ideology and whatnot. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for your word.